Good afternoon from Alexandria, Virginia, and good evening and shalom from Israel. I'm Ricky Ellison. I'm the founder and chairman of the Missile Defense Advocacy Alliance. We built this alliance 20 years ago, and I've been involved with missile defense all the way back in 1983. We, our organization, is here to educate and advocate for missile defense. We believe that it makes our world a safer place. We believe it protects infrastructure, protects people, and it deters more conflict or war. So we are on a, a great panel today, very excited about Israel. Homeland, Israel, uh, my first opportunity to be in Israel was back in 1984 after I finished my, my rookie year at uh, playing the Redskins and came over and stayed in a kibbutz about 10 miles south of the Lebanon border. <laughs> and there was conflict during that time. And if you look back 40 years ago, we just celebrated that with President Reagan's SDI speech. The biggest partner, our international partner that we did in this Street Defense Initiative was the sign of the MOU with Israel. And the development of Israel and the Treaty of Defense Initiative and the billions of dollars that, that we spent with them in developing missile defense capabilities was a tremendous investment, but a tremendous return on investment that we're seeing today on that. I have a chance to have a couple great friends uh, that I've shared with in Israel. I, I remember uh, Brigadier General Shohat seeing him when he was a battery commander on the aerial system. And I remember meeting Yair when he was developing and in charge of the IMDO many years ago. So we're coming to you today because we have a challenge in the world today on cruise missile defense architecture. We're challenged to figure that out. We've been exposed uh, by Russia and Ukraine. And in the Ukraine set, we've had to we have, you know, patch and MacGyver different systems together to try and beat that. We know Europe's trying to figure out how to create a, a, a cruise missile defense architecture that fits in and layers in all the way up to the top to the bottom. We know in our country that the U.S. Air Force just got assigned to create an architecture for cruise missile defense by the SECDEF. And we know we're trying to get that same issue in Guam. So it is a very pertinent problem that the world's working on. And we see Israel, who has perfected point defense better than anybody in the world, under combat and proven system, layered system, that can see, identify persistently all the threats, low and slow, speed, and have effectors to be able to take that out and be able to do some remarkable things. I mean, the reload capability is, is also remarkable in what they're able to do and the amount of volume that they're able to take down. They've protected their people, 9 million. They have protected their infrastructure. They have invested with us and they are the forward leaning country in the world today on missile defense technology that's applicable in combat proven and out there defending populations from missile attack. So we, we want to, as an audience, and as we want to understand what the best lessons are and how those best lessons from Israel can apply to other areas in the world. I know it's point defense, but how can we best learn from what is going on in Israel? And earlier this month, we, they experienced a pretty high level five day rocket attack. They were very successful at it. I think they had their very first intercept with the David Sling, their cruise missile defense effector. So we're going to go through all that and we're going to start off with one of our own. We have an MDAA fellow in Israel that's been with us as long as uh, I've known, I think probably 20 years, Tal. So Tal Imbar is. I believe one of the world's best uh, analysts on missiles. I don't think there's anybody better than him, including think tanks. So I like everybody to uh, have a have a listen, 
and welcome Tal Inbar from Israel on the threat situation. Thanks, Tal. Uh, thank you, uh, Ricky, for the introduction and uh, for setting this uh, virtual uh, roundtable. Uh, I, ha I do have some slides, so uh, if uh, we can see them. Um, well, uh, the issue of uh, cruise missiles is uh, is getting more and more, uh, let's say, uh, up to date in the various uh, theaters in in the world, and uh, I I think that the the best uh, uh, starting point will be uh, a little bit uh, explanation about what's going on, not uh, just in uh, Ukraine but in uh, our region uh, in Iran. So uh, next slide, please. Um, uh, Iran uh, is known to be not only uh, a manufacturer of uh, cruise missiles, but a proliferator in a variety of uh, theaters like uh, Yemen. Uh, those are missiles supplied by Iran uh, to the Houthis. And they started, this is Quds uh, missile, uh, they started uh, with Quds 1 and today we see uh, two more generations of this uh, vehicle, and uh, we already saw operational use of uh, those types of cruise missiles uh, back in 2019, when uh, several uh, such uh, cruise missiles were fired upon uh, Saudi Arabia uh, Aramco uh, installations. Uh, we saw um, a combined attack of uh, UAVs and cruise missiles in uh, al Khwarez and in uh, Abqaiq. And they can uh, actually cause a lot of uh, a lot of damage, uh, even though the reliability, at least of the first generation of those uh, missiles, uh, were not so good. But now uh, the Houthis in Yemen are equipped with uh, large quantities of those missiles, which are uh, manufactured in Iran using uh, a lot of commercial off-the-shelf uh, technologies, including. A uh, Chinese copy of uh, Czech uh, Republic may, uh, made in the Czech Republic uh, jet engine. So when you are speaking about uh, international uh, regulations and sanctions, uh, that's uh, uh, a good idea and uh, 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 fine thought. But the reality is much uh, challenging, and uh, we can see this uh, all the time. Next, uh, please. We cannot uh, evade from speaking a little bit about uh, Ukraine, and uh, we can see here the remains of uh, an intercepted uh, KH-55 um, cruise missile, a Russian cruise missile, which is uh, a very obsolete system, but uh, nevertheless, a lot of those missiles uh, uh, are evading air defense, and uh, we saw several types of interceptions uh, in Ukraine, using uh, different platforms from uh, cannons to uh, soil-to-air missiles uh, and even man pads uh, operated by uh, Ukrainian soldiers. So in this picture you can clearly see the uh, hits that uh, these uh, cruise missiles suffered from uh, the uh, interceptor. Next please. So if we are speaking about Iran, we can uh, see a new line of, uh, let's say, miniature or very small cruise missiles with a limited range, but nevertheless, they are uh, positioned in uh, various uh, underground facilities uh, in Iran. Those are in uh, direct threat to uh, Gulf states uh, like uh, UAE and uh, Saudi Arabia. This type of uh, missile cannot uh, reach uh, Israel from Iran. But nevertheless, uh, we can see the effort that Iran is make to uh, adjust such a missile uh, into a UAV platform. So next uh, slide, uh, we, you can see this. Um, so this is a UAV, a long uh, endurance uh, UAV made in Iran. Uh, and you can see two small cruise missiles uh, beneath. And uh, they also incorporated such a system uh, uh, with uh, helicopters. So we can see two types of unmanned uh, vehicles uh, in the same frame, uh, UAV carrying two cruise missiles. So this is uh, something uh, that we saw just uh, in the previous year. So this is something new. Uh, I am not aware of any 
operational use of this system yet, but uh, nevertheless, this is a threat. Next, please. So here you can see another type of uh, small cruise missiles uh, beneath the um, relatively large UAV, and this is not the largest in Iranian fleet. Next. And uh, don't forget uh, North Korea. So just recent, uh, in, in recent months, North Korea conducted several drills. Uh, actually, I cannot call them uh, experimentation in uh, cruise missiles because those systems are already in operational use. But uh, North Korea emphasized the fact that those, uh, uh, those missiles, uh, cruise missiles, are capable of carrying a nuclear warhead. And just recently, they showed the world a miniaturized uh, warhead, nuclear warhead, for those types of missiles and other even uh, very large and accurate uh, rockets. So you have to remember that uh, with a range of uh, several thousand kilometers, those types of systems are, are a direct uh, threat to the region uh, in a whole. And not only US bases, but also, of course, uh, South Korea and uh, even Japan. Next. So this is a, a demonstration of the size. This is a relatively large uh, cruise missile, and you can see uh, inspection by uh, Kim Jong-un during the last visit to a nuclear research, weapons research uh, facility. Next. So North Korea also demonstrated that uh, it could launch those uh, um, cruise missiles not only from uh, ground-based uh, vehicles like uh, trucks, but also from uh, a submarine. And uh, this was uh, actually launched uh, when the submarine was submerged. So you can see that uh, combining the uh, operational range of a submarine or a UAV with the um, cruise missiles uh, itself, uh, we can see that, uh, that as a power projection, this uh, system is uh, very capable. So uh, just to summarize uh, the, the statement uh, at, at the opening of our discussion, we can see cruise missiles in other countries as well. And uh, of course, from countries like uh, China and Turkey and so on, uh, we can see um, systems that are made by uh, relatively advanced uh, technologies and uh, manufacturers, but um, this is the poor man or the non-state uh, also uh, a weapon of choice that could project power uh, for a long uh, uh, range. And uh, it is uh, not always easy, to say the least, to intercept uh, those types of cruise missiles because of the uh, relatively speed, uh, low speed, but uh, a very low height, so uh, it could evade uh, some radar system that, uh, like we saw in uh, in Saudi Arabia, uh, for example. So this is uh, just to summarize uh, the opening statement, and let's hear from yeah. the other, and uh, we'll have a short discussion later. Tell, I want to ask you a couple questions here, real quick. Um, what your what the Iranian threat is? Is it standoff? Is it maneuverable? And is it comparable to what the Russians are using in Ukraine? And is Iran supplying that type of weapon system to Russia to use? Well, uh, I, I cannot say that uh, those are very highly maneuverable uh, systems, uh, but uh, speaking about supplying uh, weapons from uh, Iran to Russia, it was unimaginable a year ago to think that uh, Russia will need such a system, but uh, we know for a fact that uh, at least two types of UAV, uh, loitering munition, uh, suicide drones, uh, whatever you want to call them, the Shahed 131 and 136 are supplied in uh, relatively qu uh, large uh, quantities uh, to Russia. Uh, cruise missiles, we don't have any, uh, any proof that uh, Iranian cruise missiles were supplied, uh, or uh, on that regard, on that note, uh, not uh, ballistic missiles, but uh, time will tell. And uh, you have to also yeah, remember that uh, Russia, Russia is gaining operational uh, um, experience, and uh, Iran is, uh, of course, uh, one of the benefactors from that. Okay. And then if we go left of launch, way left, they're, they're relying on chips, correct? Those those have to rely on chips. And that supply chain of chips, and we know 
that we've seen a couple Russian cruise missiles with U.S. chips in the inside the missile structure. So is there is there a way? Are, are we looking at that far ahead of trying to block that type of chip capability to Iran and North Korea? Pardon me. Well, I, I think that uh, if you are considering a technological siege on a, on a country like Iran or North Korea, um, I think that uh, this is a nice idea, but uh, uh, our experience uh, and uh, what we saw in Ukraine, for example, shows that it is uh, not so effective, to say the least. I think uh, Yair could uh, elaborate a little bit about technological siege. Yeah. yeah, I would look at it uh, from a different perspective with your permission is uh, whether or not uh, the Western aircraft helicopters armament are relying on Chinese uh, chips and the answer is yes. So it's hard, it's hard to, uh, to put it as part of whatever we are looking on, uh, you know, monitoring such technology. Unfortunately, it's not as easy. Even you block nine, which is the uh, uh, Iranian uh, unit for navigation, mm -hmm. is available in the market. Okay. Thank you, Tal. Thank you, Yari. Our next guest is uh, Brigadier General Shohat. He was the commander of all of Israel's Muslim Defense Forces. He, he is well experienced in the systems. He grew up with the systems. His career has been throughout the growth of, of Israel's missile defense capabilities. Uh, the floor is yours, sir. Welcome. So, uh, shalom. Uh, hello, everybody. Good afternoon in the U.S. and good evening in uh, Israel, in other part of the world. It's always a great pleasure to be here uh, among uh, professional friends. And I will try to take uh, the conversation uh, from Tal that uh, wisely uh, said about the proliferation of the cruise missile uh, threat. This is a type of threat that uh, only two decades ago was uh, only uh, in the arsenal of uh, superpower. The Tomahawk uh, interceptors in a shock and awe operation and so on. And now we see this kind of threat as a common capability of uh, state actors, non-state actors, manufactured by Turkey, uh, Iran, Russia, uh, North Korea, as Tal mentioned, and used by uh, uh, non-state actors, terrorist organization, uh, as a long-range standoff weapon. Uh, and that uh, gives uh, the characteristic of this uh, type of threat, the, the the low altitude, uh, the, the slow uh, uh, velocity, the capability to uh, attack uh, from uh, 360 degrees uh, uh, angle, and the accuracy of the impact are challenging the defender uh, more than ever. So we can see uh, improved uh, system. Let's uh, take uh, the Abu Kayak in uh, uh, Saudi uh, as a reference. Uh, this multi-directional, not only this, but led the, the ELTAMS project, the Patriot upgrade the radar from a, a directional uh, coverage to 360 degree uh, coverage, because you cannot say anymore whatever the threat is uh, coming. So the detection uh, phase of the process is uh, quite uh, challenging, and uh, you need a, a mix uh, and match of uh, uh, detection uh, array, uh, multi-sensor, uh, active sensor, passive sensor, uh, elevated uh, sensor, in order to uh, to mitigate this challenge. And of course, everything should be interoper interoperable within the country. And if you are working in the alliance, you need to do it within the alliance, and that's. I think one of the challenges uh, for the NATO, uh, while you want to protect your uh, uh, system uh, cy cyber-wise from one hand, and in the other hand, you must have the right connectivity 
and the open uh, capability to other uh, allies to work uh, together uh, as the alliance. So, and even if we, we've gone through the, the detection phase, uh, of course, we still need uh, to, uh, to classify the, the threat, to understand what we need uh, to, uh, to engage. And then again, we need a mix and match of effectors that can do uh, the job. A kinetic effector, not kinetic uh, effector, a ground-based, naval-based uh, system, or air-based uh, system. Here in Israel, of course, everybody are familiar with uh, our multi-layer uh, uh, design of uh, defense. Uh, I can mention the David Sling system uh, or the Sky Sector, as it's called in the international market, uh, that uh, was just uh, procured by uh, Finland uh, as a, a medium-range uh, system that has the capability to uh, deal with this type of threat. Of course, I can mention the Iron Dome, the famous Iron Dome, or the Sky Hunter in the international market that uh, used by Israel. Uh, to defeat this type of challenge and already uh, selected uh, uh, for the interim uh, solution for the U.S. Uh, system, deployed for a while uh, to Guam as a part of the, uh, the response, and uh, selected uh, not only because it's a serum capability, but as the Army reported at uh, that time, the capability against the uh, cruise missile uh, and that goes uh, also to the Army and also to the uh, U.S. Uh, Marine Corps and maybe in the, in the future also for the, uh, for the Air Force. Uh, maybe last but not least, I can mention the, the non-kinetic uh, capability, uh, the high-power laser that are now in the maybe final process of uh, development. This is a type of technology that we are dealing for a few decades in order to field it. I believe uh, that it's, uh, it hasn't been mature yet uh, as an entire system. And uh, my personal uh, view, because of a uh, few of limitation of this type of technology, it would only uh, can be as a complementary uh, system to other kinetic system, but not a standalone uh, one. Either it's a ground-based uh, uh, high-power laser, or of course the preferred way of airborne laser that uh, also uh, is in the process for a few yeah. decades uh, now, which can uh, be more uh, relevant, but has some other uh, operational uh, challenges in order to field it uh, in the right way uh, on the battlefield. Uh, of course, I would like to take the opportunity to uh, appreciate uh, what just uh, Ricky mentioned, the uh, investment of the U.S. Uh, administration along the years uh, in, uh, in the capability of the State of Israel to defend the State of Israel. This type of system not only uh, save life, but save a lot of infrastructure uh, damage. And I think it's a uh, return on, on investment only in the uh, eliminating the damage to infrastructure is uh, a positive uh, ROI. And uh, from time to time, I think it uh, also helps to reduce the aggression between uh, both sides because uh, of uh, the capability to eliminate uh, some damages and uh, casualties uh, from both sides. So thank you uh, for now, I'm ready for questions. Thank you. Uh, you. You mentioned the probably the biggest challenge for cruise missile defense was that 360 low, slow, low heat. And we have an aversion over here to the J-Lens, or to a blimp that oversees and can track fire control. We lost one of them and didn't and land in Pennsylvania. We've never picked it up. And you have done remarkable, I believe, with a similar version of a, of a blimp that can do both fire control and persistent overseeing a wide area of coverage, saving the cost of 
you know, 4,000 air sorties to do the same thing. Can you talk a little bit about that, or can you, can you explain what that is, the, the uh, dew system on the sensor uh, as it works for the Israeli cruise missile defense architecture? Maybe Ayir can do it better than me. I will address, uh, with your permission, uh, yes. Uh, and no doubt that engaging or uh, uh, intercepting or detecting such uh, birds uh, needs uh, eye in the sky. And how you have eye in the sky, you need is an aircraft or a blimp, a tethered balloon. And yes, Israel developed with DECOM a large balloon, quite large, 117 meter length uh, compared to 74 Jalens or 71 uh, oh. that, that carry sophisticated radar. Is this enough? Answer is no. You need yeah. also ground sensor, electro-optical, airlint, radars, you need aircraft, you need all of these uh, set of uh, sensor to create a single air situation picture that will enable you to engage. The issue is detection. Thank you. Thanks for having the confidence and the forthright to go ahead and build something or, or have that part of your architecture. And sure, can you just talk about, because David Sling's a pretty special interceptor. I, I, I was, I think, with you as it was developed over the last 10 years. It has a dolphin head. It's, it's got an ability to maneuver like no other interceptor. And you seem to have been able to handle that problem. If you can somewhat talk about subsonic, sonic, maneuverable, and how effective that interceptor is, because I don't, I don't think we have interceptors yet for cruise missiles. Now, we're using Patriots that are very expensive for that mission. We have NASAMs for that mission. But where does David Sling fit in uh, to this? So the David Sling, uh, as you mentioned, of course, has a unique uh, shape, and that's because the dual seeker that we decided uh, to uh, to put uh, electro-optical uh, uh, seeker uh, as long as an uh, active uh, seeker, and that gives the all-weather capability uh, to the to the very agile interceptor. Uh, three-stage motor that has a lot of uh, speed and maneuver maneuverability in order to mitigate the challenge of the variety of uh, threats that he needs to, uh, to uh, deal with uh, from uh, uh, UAV uh, to uh, uh, attack uh, uh, helicopters to uh, uh, the five generation uh, aircraft uh, to a uh, long uh, range uh, ballistic uh, missile uh, and you you name it so the the need uh, to to have a common interceptor to the variety of the threats uh, made us to create maybe the highest uh, tech uh, or cutting edge technology in uh, one interceptor we also designed the interceptor uh, to be a part of family of a factor of the Patriot uh, system uh, in the meaning of the dimension, in the capability and the teaming that we have done with the Raytheon uh, company. So the interceptor is also uh, fits into the, uh, to the Patriot system in order to be one of the family of a factor that the Patriot can handle, either it, uh, it will be the GMT of uh, uh, Raytheon, or it will be the PEC-3 MSC by Lockheed, uh, or it uh, will be the uh, Sky Sector by uh, Raytheon and uh, Rafael. Uh, I think it was uh, designed to cost uh, wisely uh, manufactured, so it make it affordable comparing to the other uh, competitors. And uh, last, not least, uh, that I would like to mention is the range capability of this interceptor. This interceptor <coughs> designed to intercept target in the long distance, uh, comparing to a medium uh, range uh, system, a few uh, dozens of uh, kilometers. And uh, for the state of Israel gives the capability 
to intercept a, a threat, conventional or not conventional threats uh, beyond our boundaries, which is very important to us as a nation because of uh, the lack of strategic depth that we have in Israel. And that is a standoff cruise missile platforms that you can go out and reach if you had to reach those, you could do that with that system. That system sounds to me that it's, it goes all the way from Iron Dome all the way up to Arrow. And it does subsonic, sonic, supersonic, and that aspect of, so you got one missile system that covers all that. So congratulations on that. Now going back to your original question, and we'll go right into Yair, is open architecture. How do you, your country, your systems link in to other countries with it? I know we're using Link 16. Are you able to put these systems on Link 16, which is our common command and control, not a fire control, to share data on that? Or how, how does this fit in to that common system? Uh, the answer is yes, definitely yes. Uh, we designed the interceptor in Rafael in an open architecture, that means, and we already proved that, and I will mention a few of the, the capabilities, uh, that means that you can uh, hook in the interceptor or tailor made the interceptor to any other uh, advanced system that you have uh, in the world. We already proved it uh, in few experience uh, along the last few years on the US soil while uh, we integrate the Iron Dome interceptor into the uh, Northrop Grumman uh, uh, radar, uh, the Gator. Uh, we already proved it by uh, using the Sentinel radar for the US uh, Army. Uh, we uh, hooked it to other uh, command and control uh, shelter. We have done it in Israel in the Iron Dome naval uh, version of the system hooking the interceptor into the uh, launcher of the, the vessel and into the command and control of the vessel. Uh, because uh, we uh, isolated the, the capability uh, to an independent uh, antenna, let's uh, take for the instance the uplink and the downlink, so we are not uh, depend on a specific radar or on specific uh, C2. And uh, I believe we can uh, do any uh, modification of uh, those system to any other uh, radar or uh, C2 uh, and even uh, launcher. We already have done a test from the multi-mission launcher at that time in the US. So the, the open architecture is not a phrase, it's a fact. Thank, thank you. Thank you for that. I think we lead right now into the developer, the former director of the Israeli Missile Defense Organization. It's similar to the Missile Defense Agency in our country, where they do the cutting edge technology. And Yair can explain the whole bit, if you can, on the, the open, I mean, some of the, the cruise missile defense architecture and how you have layers and how you're able to pick and choose which systems so you can reload or if something gets damaged, you move it, and how effective you are to play as much of this thing as you can to do it. So, uh, ladies and gentlemen, the former IMDO uh, director, Yair Ramadi. Well, uh, thank you very much, Ricky. Uh, in five to 10 minutes, I'll try to address some of those uh, points, critical points. The first one is what is cruise missile? Are we looking at Tomahawk, Tomahawk like, KH 55? or scale down like the Quds, uh, Iranian Quds. Quds, by the way, is Jerusalem. Uh, we know where it's directed to. Uh, so, and the answer is yes, we refer to it, but what about the Shahed 131, 136, which is a Delta Wing type of, uh, I would call it UAV, but it is being launched by a rocket, fly 10 to 15 <coughs> hours towards its target, 15 100 kilometers or even 2,500 kilometers. No communication, no signature, alien signature. What is this? It is also a high precision type of long range strike system, a cruise missile. So air defense or any air defense that needs to deal with those cruise missiles needs to handle 
both the high subsonic, medium, slow, all type of uh, signatures, all attitude, all azimut, and uh, to be able to operate efficient, cost per kill should be reasonable. You can't intercept a uh, Shahid 136 with a small uh, motorcycle type of engine with a propeller with $1 million type of interceptors. That's, it's not affordable. Then the area of defense, how much cost you to defend a uh, one square mile? And the answer is uh, not as easy as we expect. Most of the CFOs of the uh, aerospace company would love to have each threat to have its own weapon system that deals with it. From the government, I came both from industry and from the government, the government wants one, uh, one fit all, and that is not one fit all, that's not always the case. So at the end of my uh, discussion, I would suggest to look what we need to modify simply as simple as possible, you know, a system such as Iron Dome or David Sling in Israel, maybe some improvement in Patriot to enable them to handle these type of threats. So uh, General Shaw had mentioned that in order to engage such a threat, such threats, you need elevated sensors, ground elevated all types, and you have to invest in it because the key element in interception is to have alert, to have single air situation picture that fuse all of the data you have. If you are smart enough, you work with US in interoperability. If you are smarter, you take the entire region sensors and combine them together. Because at the end of the day, everything comes from either Iran or the proxies from Houthis in Yemen, West Iraq, Hezbollah and others, and the, those uh, cruise missiles might fly for a long distance, and we, we all, the Saudi Arabia, the Kingdom there, UAE, and even Israel succeeded to intercept such incoming threats, not 100%, but along the way. So first and most important is detection, and you have to invest in it. The second element, of course, is the integration, how you integrate it and how you are dealing with the improvement of the threats, because threats are not constant. It's a kind of, uh, you know, cat and mouse type of uh, game that uh, they are improving. You have to improve. Actually, you have to be one step ahead of the other side all the time. What we see in Ukraine is, as I told you, 4,000, maybe more type of uh, missiles, uh, long range strike, uh, most of them are airborne uh, launch, uh, they came to uh, Ukraine and just a few of them had been intercepted, maybe a couple of dozens, maybe more, but uh, we don't have a lot of evidence. The explanation why some so small number had been intercepted is the lack of single air situation picture above uh, Ukraine. We can also choose the, uh, it, what happens in uh, during the attack of, uh, I think it was uh, September 14th, uh, 2019. It was night to between 2 to 3 a.m. A combined simultaneous attack on two sides, which are apart. Uh, each one, I think, is about dozens of Couple, couple of dozens of miles apart, the small kuds like type of uh, propellers with delta wing uh, incoming arrived within about one or uh, one and a half minutes, probably single direction, but 18, one eight arrived to the target. Four uh, cruise missiles, small one to the other side, one is up cakes, the other one is El Horais but quite synchronized in terms of timing, quite accurate, that was almost four years ago. How did they penetrate the air defense? And the answer is pretty simple. There are four layers of what happened. The first one, lack of intelligence and alert. In spite of the fact that 
One should expect the Iranian to uh, launch attack on directly or indirectly in the region. One and a half months of preparation, no one saw it or at least uh, no indication. So there was no alert in, uh, in the kingdom. Second one, the aircraft, they have five AWACS and two uh, airborne, I think it's a subtype of airborne radars were on the ground. It means the Iranian have very good intelligence. You cannot have it 24-7. The third is the ground radars. Uh, they have uh, uh, quite, uh, I think, more than uh, dozens of uh, FPS uh, 117 uh, Lockheed Martin type of radars, the same we have in Israel. But if the target is flying slow and low in a hilly area, they can penetrate. And last but not least is that the air defense was sectorial rather than 360 degree. Can the engineers uh, provide better solutions? The answer is yes. Does the uh, Saudi Arabia air defense know that? They know it and they know how to handle it, no doubt about it. But the next step will not be 18. The next step might be 36 or 72 or even 100. And yet, we had already engaged 100, indeed, uh, rockets, not the, this type of threats, but we should be ready for 100 simultaneously attack all direction. And the question is, are we ready for it? And I think uh, Israel, I'm not going into details, but I think Israel current layered air defense, especially Iron Dome and David Sling can handle it and provide the uh, required defense on the country. And yes, uh, Ricky, sometimes small is beautiful. <laughs> I'm sure, and I'm sure that uh, working together with the US on the three level of cooperation, joint development, joint production, joint exercise, uh, providing the right message in the area. If Israel will be able also to combine force with its allies and friends within the region, I think this will uh, provide the best uh, answer for everyone. And yes, there are a lot of solutions how to integrate system together, US with uh, space assets and other assets with Israel and with our friend in the area. And once again, thank you very much for hosting such a session. Thank you. I, I got a couple of good questions for you, I think. But I, you hit it on the money, right? The, the attack on Abu Dhabi, where they're using $4 million interceptors against drones because they can't understand what's out there. They don't measure it or, or record it correctly. You, Israel, has done all this by themselves practically. So you haven't really, besides us, you haven't had to have the luxury of other sensors and other things from other countries. And certainly now that you're part of CENTCOM, and you said it to me that right now that you are would like to do data sharing agreements with sensors with the Arab states to give you better capacity and also for them to get better capability. You've also, what you've done, which you didn't mention, is you connected your ballistic missile defense with the cruise missile defense, which is very difficult to do. We're struggling in Europe. In Europe, we're not doing that. We haven't done it in the United States yet either. We're going to try to do it in Guam. We, we will do it in Guam. So you've, you've accomplished some of this stuff. But that's it seems to where we have to play is to have everybody chip in as your allies and trust it. Certainly the sensors. I don't know about the, the fire control yet, but the sensor aspect of it is there. So. I just, I just wanted to come back to you and say that that's where is Israel in its ability to really open up data sharing agreements with the Arab states or if that could help you with stuff coming through? Or is that well, we, yeah, yeah, thank you for the addressing the question, but yeah, I, I'm not a politician rather than a diplomatic. Uh, yeah. uh, you know, any any entity relates to it, but I'm sure it's only a question of time. Technically, about the batteries, uh, both Iridome and David Sling had been uh, tested and designed for full performance, simultaneously ballistic crews on the same. Uh, you don't have to switch 
And yes, it can work in 360 degree. It depends how you deploy it, what you do. And it is a customer requirement, I'm sure that the Israeli authorities are eager to be able to work together in the region. And yes, with the uh, joint uh, exercise, joint test and joint development with US, it work and it, it give, it's beneficial. It's, uh, I'm, I'm sure it sends the right and clear message in the area and we can uh, see it. And yes, both UAE and uh, Saudi Arabia suffered from various uh, type of threats. They're handling it very well, and they can uh, obviously they can use uh, our equipment. Also, it uh, depends on a higher level uh, decision making in the area. Good. Thank, thank you. Um, we now will go to our side of the ball here a little bit. Um, we've got one of our board of directors here with us today, former uh, Major General of the U.S. Air Force, uh, Charles Cochran Corky. And uh, he was, did I think, a pretty extensive exercise recently this year while he was in uniform over in Israel. Very astute on the F-35, F-22. We didn't talk about that with the sensor platforms and how Israel's been able to apply that, that vehicle to give them more capability to see the, see the threat. We haven't done that over, over on our side yet, but, but those are innovative things that you're doing. Um, Corky? Uh, welcome to the discussion on, on Israel Missile Defense, specifically cruise Missile Defense. Thank you, Ricky. Thanks for the kind intro. And I uh, apologize for being late. I was traveling, but uh, really appreciate the opportunity to be a part of this discussion with these, uh, these other uh, tremendously uh, capable and talented individuals. I, I tell you, I just dialed in and, and, and heard your question there, uh, particularly the last part of it, integrated air missile defense. And I, I tell you, uh, nobody does it better than Israel. We all know this. Uh, they are the model for how to actually, as a nation, a whole of nation, get after integrated air and missile defense. And, and as I look at that as a model for us, for our homeland, what we need to get after, or for Guam, which is part of our homeland, but, you know, obviously it's a standalone island. Uh, it start, start from the top, it's policy. There's got to be that national imperative. There's got to be that push. And too often, I think we focus... Uh, on, uh, we're missing the forest for the trees. You know, we're focused on, oh, well, how do we shoot down this or how do we shoot down that? Uh, in Israel, it all starts with a, this is an existential threat and we're gonna, we're gonna start way left to bang and we're gonna try to interdict these things so the archer never even has anything to, to shoot at you, right? And you see that, you see the willingness to do that, the policy level and the systems in place to get after that. Uh, and and that's, how, that's how Israel starts it. They don't even allow those guys to get the rockets and missiles, et cetera. I think we as a nation got to start thinking more about that rather than just in-game intercept. Uh, from there, yeah, there is the integration across uh, all the various threats, uh, to the, the ability to see them, to, you know, to sense and make sense and act. So the sensors, you just brought up F-35 and F-22 when I was over in Israel uh, in January recently. Uh, it, was, it was great to see how they're integrating uh, the F-35 with all the ground-based radars, with the, uh, you know, the uh, the, the unmanned sensors they have uh, and, and pulling all this together uh, so that they have a holistic picture. So that they got that, they got the roles and responsibilities, right? They got somebody in charge, not a bunch of different people trying to figure out who's in charge. They got somebody in charge, they got the sensors, they got the operations center uh, and everybody at every level knows what their role is. And, and that allows them to, to get after this uh, uh, you know, as soon as as soon as as soon as the wick is lit on a bad guy rocket or missile of any type coming towards them, they're ready to go. A small UAS, etc. So I think there are many lessons that the U.S. can take from this. We got to get we got to get the roles and missions fixed. We got to get the policy fixed. We got to get the sensors in place like the Israelis have. And I guess at the end of the day, what I say is we got to get our ego out of the way. There's a lot we can learn from partners, large and small, who have capabilities, who have tactics, techniques, and procedures that we could put in place. Uh, just because we're, we're maybe a bigger country or a bigger force, it doesn't mean we have all the answers or know what to do. There's a lot we can learn, especially from a country like Israel, that is the model of how to do this in an integrated fashion against all these threats from way left to launch until in game if it's required with, a, with an inbound missile. So um, I'll stop there. That's kind of my, my big picture takeaway is we need to, we really need to try to learn from our friends and integrate what they're doing and, and copy what they're doing, mimic what they're doing to get our homeland 
defense right across the board, not just cruise missile, but across the board. Over to you, Ricky. Corky, what, if you look at what they're doing, right, they, they, they got the JLNs basically up, they steroided that thing up. Right. That's working for them 100%. Right. They're, they're using their F-35s. We got many more F-35s for sensor platforms to help it. Why, what's the problem with the U.S. not doing this the way they're doing it? Why, why? It's got to be more than ego. What, what, what is it that we can't duplicate what they're doing? or can't share what they're doing or can't bring them in? Does it have to be growing here? What, what is, what's preventing us to have that big time match on our side? I think it starts with a sense of urgency, Ricky. I mean, Israel lives in a tough neighborhood and they have to do, they're scrapping and fighting every day to survive, to stay in existence as a state. They're fighting people who don't want them to exist. Uh, we do not have that sense of urgency. We have the two big moats called the Atlantic and Pacific and we. We've taken it for granted for way too long. Uh, so we're starting to get a little bit more of a sense of urgency. We're still out there. Uh, and then secondly, uh, you know, we, we got a lot of area to cover. We got a lot of, so you talk about JLINs, things like that. We've got to figure out how to leverage those types of sensors that are, you know, that are persistent, that are, that are affordable. And you can't have F-35s flying all around your coast all the time. It's just unobtainium, right? Uh, but if you have them stationed in the right places and you have other effectors in the right places, and then you have that persistent watch of things like JLANs and other sensor capabilities. Then, you know, if the time comes, if when the time comes, you could scramble F-35s to help them be a part of it. But uh, we, we got to think differently. We got to think, we got to think, how can we scale things that, that Israel is doing that we can afford that, that would help us with, with our homeland and for other partners, to help other partners, right? Uh, there's no reason, you just mentioned the UAE, there's no reason they should be, a, should be a shooting down small one-way attack UAVs with multi-million dollars or even sometimes billion dollar uh, systems. It's, you're not gonna win that in the long game. Hey, Corky, one more thing here. You've seen what they're doing, right? Their Air Force runs the whole show. Right. Our Air Force doesn't run the show. No. Our, our Army runs the show on land. Our, well, so, so, so yeah. So I, I just, <laughs> help me with that. Or do you, is there a parallel or just that's different? I, well, I think the parallel is that they have somebody in charge. I don't care if it's the Army or the Navy or the Air Force. Really, it's a combatant commander who's in charge but uh, in our system, which is great. But but we've got to have the, the C2 structure in place and we've got to have the people organized, trained, and equipped to operate the systems and do the mission. So it's not so much about who does it. It's about making sure that there is a, a, a single belly button in charge that has the hammer for integrated air and missile defense, not somebody for hypersonic, somebody for ballistic, somebody for cruise, somebody else for this, that, or the other. There is there is a person in charge who has got the authority, got the responsibility, and will be held accountable if it fails. And we, we've got to have those discussions about if we're not doing that right, we got to fix it. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Corky. All right, Dave, you got a couple minutes, and, and then certainly we're, we're going to probably flow over time a little bit, but. You, you've got a great perspective, Dave, being a former 10th AAMBC commander. I think it was over there when you guys were there, when when we were, when our 10th was part of Israel on it. You've got an Army perspective on the cruise missile defense thing. So you have a pretty good perspective from a different viewpoint than what, what, what's at the table here. So it's yours, sir. Yeah, so thanks, Ricky. And uh, thanks I'm sorry, I'm sorry. Dave, Dave's an advisor to MBA. He's been with us for quite a while. So I, I didn't introduce you correctly. I'm sorry. Go ahead. No, that's quite all right. Uh, but uh, thanks, Ricky, and uh, thanks for the opportunity, and great to see some old friends here. Um, and so uh, we'll try to go speed round here because, as you mentioned, we are uh, uh, closing in on the uh, time frame. Uh, I really want to start off with uh, yeah, here, if I can, as the former IMDO director. Um, you know, we haven't we haven't talked autonomy or or uh, artificial intelligence and, and and the benefits that that exist uh, as we move into that those. Uh, those areas, um, uh, Yair, could could you share uh, some of your thoughts with regards to autonomous operations, please? Well, uh, autonomous operation uh, in strike in uh, counter attack is one issue, and defense it's a little different. Uh, we do not uh, provide full autonomy to uh, air defense uh, system. We need always an operator and the operator is the one who dictates. He doesn't push the button, button actually for firing, but he's enabling. 
Uh, this is a concept, still we have time. We are trying to intercept uh, a long distance from our border. It's not always visible. If you are being, uh, you are engaging uh, a time critical type of targets that fly to you and you have a couple of seconds, still a human being involved. About AI is, I would not go into details. It's part of the command and control and it will play a little more and more a better importance within along the time. And I'm sure as well as we are developing here a autonomous car, cars and the same will happen with other system, mainly in strike, less in defense. Thank you, Ayer. Uh, General Shohat, uh, uh, as a former IDF commander, um, uh, and just from, from my personal experience as a, a former double MGC commander uh, supporting uh, the Defense of Israel mission, um, Cor Corky, Corky nailed it. Uh, there, there's no better blueprint than what the IDF uh, uh, presents uh, when it comes to uh, integrated air missile defense. Uh, the U.S., uh, uh, I, I would submit that we, if I can use the cliche, we have a hole in our swing, and it's with cruise missile defense. Um, what, what are what are some of the uh, some of your thoughts? Uh, uh, with without trying to back you into a corner or anything uh, about uh, improvements with regards to uh, cruise missile defense for a, for the uh, United States. So first of all, I uh, would like to echo uh, Corky's uh, statement. I think we need to put a little bit ego uh, aside, but I also would like uh, to mention uh, for the US favorite that what we called in Israel a uh, national uh, defense is uh, smaller than uh, regional defense for you. But still, I think uh, we can adapt and learn from each other and uh, imitate some uh, uh, capabilities and doctrine in order to uh, work uh, better uh, together in, uh, in coalition. Uh, and uh, I think the, we need to be, although the cyber issue and the and I'm not naive, I'm, I'm, I understand the politic of an organization uh, within the armed forces. Uh, I see the barrier uh, between uh, Air Force and Army and Navy uh, all over the world and between a nation, but still we have to be more open-minded and, uh, uh, and uh, be open to uh, collaboration. I was mentioned uh, during uh, the session, if I take the, the new generation of command and control for the US, the IBCS by uh, Northrop Grumman, which is going to be the, the most uh, common and the selected uh, uh, command and control for the entire uh, uh, troops from the battery level up to the uh, brigade level. So if the US is working uh, crisis in the other region and that's the type of the fight that US uh, are doing uh, generally you are not doing uh, homeland defense uh, every day so you need to uh, open the gate to integrate into the your uh, C2 uh, system in order to work interoperable with your alliances whatever it will be NATO and so on and uh, somehow the direction all over the world, not only for the US, is the opposite. Everybody is closing, everybody is putting firewalls. Uh, so, and the, the result is that uh, there is no real interoperability between the system. Uh, Tal and Yair just mentioned in the Ukraine conflict, uh, the, the less of uh, capability or the lack of capability in order to uh, to work uh, together, to have a common picture, and so on. And I think this is the direction we need uh, to move uh, forward, and to reduce a little bit the, the barrier, to do it, of course, uh, smart and wise, uh, but uh, still we have to be uh, more cooperative and collaborative uh, between uh, uh, friendly uh, forces. 
And maybe last thing I would like to mention that is because of the what we talk today about the cruise missile of the accuracy, I see an urgent need to uh, defend the protector or to protect the defender, a uh, closing uh, weapons uh, defense. Uh, we see the precise strike uh, in Ukraine. So I believe that there is an urgent need for a new, very short range capability in order to do self-defense uh, to strategic installation, to, uh, to maneuver forces, to, to uh, critical infrastructure uh, in order, and of course to uh, air defense uh, system in order to uh, ensure the capability to uh, survive in the new battlefield. And Dave, can you ask Yair that same question? I want to hear from him too. Yair, your thoughts. I will, I will uh, prefer standing behind uh, General Shohat's uh, observations. Yeah. They were great. They're phenomenal. They were very well done. I just wanted to see if you wanted to chip in. Okay. Well done. Hey, Sarah. Ricky, I, th I, th I think you got some time. Go ahead. You can go ahead and open up. Some okay. Yeah, I want to. Okay. I've got two more questions. Um, uh, if I may, and uh, and I'll just one with one for Tal, and then and then I'll uh, I'll end it with a question for Corky. Um, but but Tal, you know we, we haven't talked about China. Uh, we've talked a little bit about Russia. Um, uh, we we we've uh, we've all watched uh, uh, what's transpired in the Ukraine for the last uh, 400 plus days uh, during what I've termed a second or a further invasion uh, of that country. Um, yeah, and we recognize, at least I, I, my opinion is, uh, Russia has made some some mistakes when it comes to combined arms fighting, uh, leveraging capability, um, because I, I think for all intents and purposes, uh, Russia saw a much shorter uh, conflict than what continues to this day. So um, can you talk about, uh, you know, from an intel perspective, um, maybe some compare and contrast on what we could expect to see uh, out of uh, China and a potential invasion of Taiwan uh, versus what we've seen with uh, Russia and the Ukraine. Well, that's a, that's a whole uh, different story, Ricky. I think uh, Ch Taiwan and, uh, Chi and China deserves uh, its own uh, event, but uh, I think that uh, the lesson that uh, the, at least uh, one of the lessons that uh, China can draw from the uh, war in Ukraine is that um, it's not so easy even to, uh, let's say, uh, to be on the upper hand uh, against a relatively weak uh, opponent uh, because uh, this opponent is not so weak. And uh, the, the big issue is intelligence. And uh, we have to remember that uh, without uh, some, let's say, foreign help uh, in intelligence, uh, Ukrainian uh, successes were not so, uh, as we see, uh, uh, every, every, every other day. So it will be, um, it will be a much uh, challenging task if China would uh, think about uh, um, do some kinetic effects vis-a-vis uh, -vis Taiwan, uh, but uh, nevertheless, uh, another lesson is that uh, every every side uh, that uh, wants to to be still uh, operating after uh, several time several a period of uh, let's say uh, military operations needs to have uh, a good and credible air defense. So air, air defense and intelligence are at least. Uh, in my point of view, one of the best uh, lessons that uh, everybody could uh, could learn from uh, Ukraine. Yeah, th thanks, Tal. And I know that was a tough one. And 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 and, and surely uh, the conflict uh, between Russia and Ukraine, uh, uh, the Ukrainians have clearly demonstrated the need for short-range air defense uh, and the success that they've had uh, successes that they've had on the battlefield. Um, and then uh, last question there uh, for Corky, if I may. It's great to see you again, Corky. Um, uh, if we could just talk a little bit about the, the conflict uh, between Russia and, and the Ukraine. You know, the Russians have launched thousands uh, of, uh, of, uh, of uh, missiles uh, in, a, in, a, in a variety of forms. You know, somebody mentioned uh, 
earlier in the in the discussion, uh, mostly uh, air launch uh, uh, missiles. Um, the Ukrainians have a, a great deal of uh, capability. Um, some would argue um, whether or not it's integrated or not. Uh, I would submit that not everything needs to be integrated. Um, the, the passing of early warning, uh, you know, a, a sensor architecture that's previously been mentioned and the sharing of early warning is vital to, to the success of an engagement. Um, but can you talk about just from your foxhole, uh, what, what, uh, the contributions of the Patriot uh, system, the NASAMS capability, um, as well as uh, short-range air defense capabilities, not just from the U.S., but, uh, but many contributors, and what that's done for the Ukrainian forces against uh, the Russian uh, fleet. Yeah, you bet, Dave. Hey, it was great to see you again, buddy. Uh, thanks for being a part of this. Uh, well, well, like was just said, uh, Tal, I think it all starts with intel. And so what you mentioned, the sharing of intel with the Ukrainians has been a, a boon for them, right? And fr from from the get-go, before the invasion started, letting them know what we knew or, or, or had a pretty good idea of what was going to happen, allowing them to uh, to do some passive defense work to make sure that, that, that things were more survivable. And then uh, what you said, uh, I, I agree with what you submitted. Everything doesn't need to be integrated, but it certainly needs to be a coordinator, right? There needs, everybody needs to be on the same sheet of music. And, and the Ukrainians have clearly done that. They have taken what, what we've, well, I think we're, we're affectionately calling Franken-Sams right now. They, they've, they've pieced together so many different pieces of equipment from, and capabilities from numerous uh, countries and, and with sheer will, with the sheer force of will. And I would say a, a, really, a, a, really, a, a really capable C2 structure uh, at, at all tiers. They've done a pretty darn good job of, of thwarting, uh, thwarting Russia's attempts to, uh, to, to break the will of the people, to take out their power grids, et cetera, et cetera. They, they've, they've taken a lot of blows, but they've, they've proven the ability to come back. Um, my, I guess my big takeaway uh, overall from that conflict is that uh, Russia, Russia's inability to, to gain air superiority over the battlefield due to primarily Ukraine's ability to, 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 uh, to defend their airspace with all the systems that we've talked about has, uh, has just forced Russia's uh, invasion to stall. I mean, Russia is not a, a very well-organized, trained, and equipped force is what we found. They don't do combined arms well. They're not a joint force. And, and Ukraine has, uh, and by Ukraine, uh, Ukraine defending their skies the way they have, they've just, they've stalled Russia's attack. And we're looking at really a World War One style fight right now. Um, um, and it's a, uh, it's just a, it's a grind. So uh, I think there's a lot we can learn from how they've integrated various systems uh, uh, on the fly. And uh, there's a lot we can learn about the, uh, the, the need to be able to overcome the enemy's defense defenses uh, so that we can support our, our, our folks on the battlefield. If we want to, if we ever get in a, a slugfest like this, because uh, that's how you're going to be able to take the initiative. If you get on the skies and do what you want to do, everything else is easy, but it's not so easy to on those skies is what the Ukrainians have shown. All right, let's pull it back to Israel now. Let's pull this thing back because that's the model. I mean, let's be real here. We don't want to fight like we're fighting in Ukraine. No way. We want to fight like we were fighting in Israel with that kind of integration joint force deal. And that's where NATO's got to go. They can't go to a Ukraine model. We, Taiwan can't go to a Ukraine model. We've got to go to an Israel model. That's where we're at. And we're, we're, we're not accepting that. And I, I think it's both ways. I don't see Iron Dome over in Ukraine. I don't see Israel, these systems over there either. So it, it is a mutual trust here that I think we all hit upon it to get us to fight better than we ever can is to have some trust with each other to do agreements and integration and open architecture with so, you know source code shared with everything to get this thing where we want to go yes you're the ideal part but you're such a small country we got to move that that philosophy on how you fight air defense which is the best in the world to your friends and allies to help keep this world in the right space we're being challenged by Russia and China. We're being challenged by our way of life, and we have to fight as a community to do this. 
So I, that's why I have just tremendous respect for what you do in Israel. Everybody does. And we got to be able to take those lessons. We got to be able to take your system. We got to we have to help take those that make everybody else better. That's we're, we're not there yet. So that's that's where we're at. All right. We're a little over time. I'd like everybody just do a, a closing statement and we'll go around the room uh, on that. So uh, why don't you kick it off, Dave? You're the last one up. So you might as well start it off. Yeah, hard, hard to uh, follow my esteemed colleagues and, and, and great points there at the end, Ricky. Uh, again, thanks for uh, allowing me to participate. Um, I, I think Tal, as Corky alluded to, Tal nailed it with the intel piece. Yeah. Um, you know, we've all, uh, Corky nailed it with the, the coordinated coordination piece that well, while we may not be integrated across the board, we definitely have to be coordinated. Uh, I think Yair and, and John Shohat, they both alluded to uh, the cost effectiveness of engaging uh, the right inter the right uh, target with the right interceptor capability. Uh, and, and so uh, uh, ultimately it, it, it's all about layering and a layered defense. You know, if you can't get left to launch, you've got to have the capability uh, th through layering uh, to defend the critical assets uh, in order to be uh, successful and and, uh, and, and ultimately uh, uh, succeed. Uh, thanks again, Ricky, and uh, I'll pause there. All right, Tal. Well, I think uh, Dave already summarized it uh, perfectly, and uh, I think uh, one other issue is that uh, the inter in international uh, uh, dialogue should uh, should be continued, and um, there are a lot of uh, new opportunities in uh, our region, not only uh, within Israel, but this is for another issue. Thank you, Corky. Yeah, thanks, Ricky, and thanks to all the esteemed colleagues. It's a pleasure to be a part of this panel with you. I guess uh, here's what I'll say, Ricky. I'll push back on you a little bit. I think Israel is a model, and I think Ukraine is. Uh, is uh, evidence of how you can push towards that model in a crisis. I think they're driving towards integration and open codes. So they've linked NASAMs and Patriot and all these and, and former Soviet systems. And when there's a crisis, we've proven we can do it. So I think we should actually say, hey, why does it take a crisis, NATO? Why does it take a crisis, Middle East partners? Let's do it before the crisis. And the next thing we're going to give to Ukraine is, is the fighters. So you mentioned F-35s in Israel. But, so we're going to get them F-16s now. And, and they're going to link that in as well to the integrated air missile defense. So uh, I think the real lesson is we, we can do it in crisis. Israel's the model. Let's not wait for the crisis to do it. Yeah, Thanks, Ricky, point. for hosting. Yeah, it's great, great point, Corky. Thank you. Shahir? Well, uh, thank you very much. Uh, our whole uh, you know, it's our pleasure to be here. Keep in mind it all the time we are in arm race. It's improving of the threat and we will try to be one step ahead with our allies and friends in the region and with the support of US. Thank you, Yair. John Shohat? I couldn't agree more uh, of uh, Corky's statement. Uh, I think uh, uh, air defense operation are a very convenient ground for cooperation because of the basic uh, rights to defend yourself. Uh, attack operation are much more capable, uh, complex, excuse me. So I think this is a, a common ground to, to start uh, cooperate. Uh, I enjoyed the professional conversation. I'd like to thank you for hosting us and for dealing and raising this important issue. Uh, enjoy it very much. Best of luck. Thank, thank you. Thank you, Jim. I thought it was a, an engaging conversation, it's certainly educational for the Israeli elements that you brought forward on the Christmas defense and, and the challenges of getting to where we go. As, as Corky mentioned, as Shari mentioned, as Yari mentioned, as Dave and Ty, towel on it. So uh, thank you very much. Shalom and peace be with you.